the, the upper swan somewhat unique and it was one of the last places in the lower 48 to be permanently settled. Uh, there was other places also, but uh, th this was fairly late in the, the whole scheme of things. Uh, we, we did have seasonal use with the uh, Ponderé travel folks uh, across the mountains, but they mostly operated here in the summer and fall, but not year-round. Uh, too deep to snow, it was a little easier winter on the other side. Uh, this area, we did have some early day trappers and prospectors, uh, and then later some homesteaders that came into here, but the big influx of this uh, was in the 1910s, you know, the teens anyway, uh, 1916, 1917 was the big influx of homesteaders in this valley. Uh, but people that applied and signed up for this, they had to prove up. They would get mostly 160 acres, some of them were smaller, some of, uh, most, most of them were 160 acres though. But, uh, but they had to prove up in order to gain ownership of that 160 acres or whatever their homestead uh, piece was. Uh, they had to live on it for several years. They had to put 20 acres into agriculture. And most of the land back here in that time was very heavily wooded or very brushy if it was like in wet areas and stuff like that. So to put 20 acres into agriculture is pretty tough. Uh, they also had to construct permanent buildings. They didn't want, what they didn't want was land grab type of things where uh, some folks would come in, sort of act like they were homesteading, but as soon as they proved up, then sell it to the major timber companies or whatever and turn a quick buck on it. They wanted permanent people to live here. So, then they had five years to prove up on it. Now, there was a lot of challenges for our early day homesteaders. First of all, this place was pretty remote back in those days. To come from Missoula or from Kalispell, either one, into this area, if you were bringing a, a team of horses and wagons, a lot of times the early folks, they talked about it being a five-day trip. And now it's an hour and a half on the highway. So, big, big difference. So, it seemed like they were in the middle of nowhere at the time. If it was in the summer, it was actually the quickest way to get in and out of here was to go up and over. There was a few trails coming over the Mission Mountains, and that was actually a quicker way, but you would have to either be on foot or on horse. You couldn't do the horse wagon and that sort of thing. So, uh, we had long winters here, and if you're talking about agriculture and stuff, that's kind of, that's a strike one already. We have deep snow. That's another one. Uh, we have short growing seasons, we have thin rocky soils, they don't call us the Rocky Mountains for nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have heavy forest cover, we have thick brush, and, uh, and probably something that very real was there was almost very, very limited economic opportunities. And, you know, the people that came in here, you got to have a little bit of money. I mean, if nothing else, to pay your taxes every year. But most of them had to have uh, a, some sort of way to fund to buy a 100-pound uh, sack of flour and sugar and whatever they needed to, you know, the, the basics and all of that. An awful lot of people came up here and ate nothing but venison and fish and huckleberries and things like that. They scratched out a little bit of a garden. But by and large, it, you still needed some income to make a go of it here. You know, and once people proved up, there was still some of that, some of the people proved up and sold it immediately type of thing to somebody else, not the timber companies or anything, but uh, but then, you know, a lot of them, there was still some of the families that stayed. The, the Depression era hit the homesteaders particularly hard in this area because, you know, there was never a lot of economic ways to make a living here, and when the Depression hit, it was even less. And a number of homesteads, they lost everything because they couldn't pay their back taxes. I live, we have 20 acres that used to be part of a 160 acre homestead. And the lady that owned it during the depression, she lost it in 1936 because she couldn't pay $22.88 in taxes. That's how tough time.
lot of times, and especially in those very early years, because you did need some money, oftentimes people would leave the valley to earn a living for a while. Uh, if the guys would often work in the old uh, logging camps, and they would leave the valley for that. There was no logging really going on here at the time, other than people just clearing their land. We were too far from markets. There was no transportation systems, all of that. So a lot of folks had to leave the valleys. Uh, out of that 102 people that did prove up, nine of them were women, and some of them would leave the valley to work in various, uh, I know some were teachers, some were clerks, different things like that, but uh, most of them left the valley also. And that was a big source of contention with the government. It's like, hey, you guys wasn't up here homesteading. You were down in Missoula making a living. But, you know, there was a little give and take, and some of that got contested and would have to go to meetings. And anyway, uh, a lot of times they ruled in favor of the homesteader, though. There was a little bit of money, or you could make a little bit of money with the local sawmills and construction in those early years. Uh, there, it, was, it was pretty small scale. Uh, the sawmills would just make boards mostly for like floors, uh, doors, just other homesteaders that were building their place. They need a little bit of lumber, so uh, this particular sawmill was up on Cooney Creek, Rumble Creek, and uh, it was water powered. You can just kind of see the big wheel there that would spin it, that would run the belt over, and then there were saws that would go like that, but a uh, slow way of making lumber, but they could do it. This is, I don't know if you've looked at the notching on the cookhouse, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a dovetail notch, and it's considered, uh, out of all the log building, this is considered some of the best uh, craftsmanship. And there was a little bit of moonshine that went on, especially during Prohibition, but it was something that somebody could make local and transport out of the valley for cash. And there was a little bit of that that went on. Uh, they suspect this cabin that's down off of Piper Creek might have been that. There was rumor of a moonshiner that was kind of hanging out in that area for a while. Where were people coming from? Were they coming from all over? You know, uh, we had a lot of different folks come up here, but uh, not all of them, but we had a pretty good contingent of Finlanders that moved up here. They had just come over, a lot of them had just came over from the old country and had heard about the opportunity of getting free land. And this being one of the last places of that opportunity during that time period that they came and everything, uh, but we did have class, and a lot of them, they worked their way across uh, the states and stuff, but some of them had stopped in uh, like Minnesota and places like that in some of the lumber camps and all that, but then some of them had kept coming because uh, of all of that. A lot of them actually started down at Bonner, uh, Missoula area, because there was a lot of uh, timber, lumber stuff going on there at the time. So they started there. A lot of these folks already came with these skills from Finland. They, they knew the, the lumber business. They knew how to build log homes. And some of the, you know, log home building is still kind of a viable thing here in the valley to this day, but it kind of started with the, mostly with the Finlanders back then. And all of that.